Hi, my name is uh, Tim Bollier. I'm excited to talk to you a little bit today about my involvement with the Association for the Advancement of the French Language and Francophone Culture of the United States. I think this is a really great time for an organization like this to be put together. Um, there's a lot of great work being done around the country um, in um, very similar organizations, but we are somewhat siloed based upon where we had immigrated to or you know our interests. So it'll be good to bring some everyone together um, to bring those skills and, and unique interests all under one roof. Um, some, in, some background about me. Um, I um, was born in Massachusetts. Most of my French, Franco-American, which I'll get into. We didn't really use that term in my family. My French-Canadian heritage would go back to um, mills in Massachusetts um, on the North Shore. Um, my family immigrated to New Hampshire. That's a New England joke for those of you who aren't familiar with how it is here. Um, to New Hampshire in the 80s, uh, pursuing lower taxes and such. Um, I, went, I attended the University of New Hampshire and studied business. Um, I got my master's at Plymouth State University in small business. Um, so my background is really entrepreneurship and um, business stuff. I'm really not an academic. I, I, don't, I don't speak the French language. I do know a little bit. I've been picking it up being around um, folks at the Franco-American Center in Manchester um, and online. Um, but I'm not a French speaker. Um, I'll get into that a little bit too. Um, so, just like I have some notes to go over the side, I'm going to go back and forth. Again, I'm not really a speaker, but I, I try my best. Um, so, my family, I, you know, we came down from, from Quebec um, on my father's side, both sides of French Canadian ancestry. Like many Americans, I'm not 100% anything, um, but I'm primarily French Canadian um, descent. Um, came down from uh, on my father's side, we'll, we'll start with that um, line there. I came down from. Um, Saint Clement um, in Quebec um, in uh, the 1890s um, to Salem. Um, worked in the mills there. My great grandfather had 12 kids. Um, and over time, I, I don't know the exact story, so this is you know, the early 20th century. Um, they did not hand down the French language to my grandfather. He's part of the World War II generation. Um, but they did, you know, travel back to Quebec and um, um, it's the right way to say this, you know, carried on some of the traditions, but many of those were not passed down to me or to my father. My father was given almost nothing. We didn't really know much about our French Canadian background or Quebec. I mean, for a little while there, we thought we might be from France. The only thing we really had, um, as I try to say my last name, Bollier, it's probably Bollier, and, and the, as close as I can to the way it would be said in Quebec. Um, there's a lot of folks in my area who say in particular strange anglicized ways that really make no sense in any language. Um, so I fight back against that a little bit. That's my, my, personal, my personal struggle there. Um, in any case, um, so with the, the background there. So um, like I was saying, you know, we didn't really know much about it, um, the background. But uh, when I was, I don't know, in my mid, mid early 20s, um, I was on spring break from UNH. Um, and came back and spent some time with my grandfather. At the time, my grandmother and grandfather had moved to New Hampshire to kind of be closer to the family. They were getting older and just wanted to um, to be closer to us for help and things like that. Um, he'd just start telling me stories about trips back back to Quebec, um, which he would he called Canada. He never really used the term Quebec. He was uh, they're Canadian and they would go back to Canada. That's the terms he used. But I really think he was saying Canadian. But again, the language was really not passed to him. So I learned a lot of these stories, um, and it just seemed, you know, like he wanted to connect to it more, but he was a very much of that, you know, I'm, I'm the tough soldier. Like I said, he was, a, he fought in World War II. Um, um, you know, didn't want to admit that he had lost anything. Um, and for the first time when I heard these things, I felt maybe that we had lost something. Um, you know, we didn't have the language. Um, as you've heard from probably other folks on this board, they who are of French Canadian background, they they had they spoke French in school, or they had traditions. They used mémère, pépère. We didn't use any of that. Um, so, you know, it just felt like he was missing something. Um, this really resonated with me quite a bit, um, and I begin to kind of wonder a little bit about where I came from. Fast forward a few years, I go to college, do all that stuff, graduate, figure out what I want to do. Still don't know. Um, and I begin to kind of, you know, run into 
I'll say like instances where I kind of went back to those stories. I was on my uh, honeymoon with my wife and we were in Bermuda and there was a whole bunch of uh, Quebecois on our boat. Um, I noticed them. I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, we're, we're somehow related, I'm sure. That's what the big joke in the French Canadian community. But at one point we were on, we were um, uh, in Bermuda walking around on the beach and um, a couple of the, the Quebecois were lost. And I, you know, I didn't know how, what to do. Like I, they, they were asking to get to the beach. The bus driver said we were on the pink bus in Bermuda. And I, you know, was like, uh, you know, I took out my license and said, hey, you know, I'm French Canadian, you know, descent. I don't know if they understood what I said, but they could see my name was Bollier and said, you know, help you. And, you know, my wife and I got them to the beach and they waved and, and periodic on the boat, you know, we'd wave and, you know, exchange like hellos for the rest of the week. Um, you know, and that kind of kept going on. We went up to Montreal a lot. Um, you know, the whole, the whole expo thing, I'm a huge baseball person. I went to Montreal to see games and just check out the city. My second favorite city behind Boston. Um, and I noticed, you know, when I'm up there, you know, they're like making, you know, my friends are not all, are not all French. So I did notice, you know, poking fun at them a little bit. And, you know, I didn't really like it. I could, you know, I like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't really do that either myself. And I, I felt that it was wrong to do that. Um we went back a few more times and every time I went back, I felt more connected to it. And, you know, at this point I see Quebec as like the motherland of, of my family, the Bollier family. Um, I know I'd say I talk about my mom's side of the family. You know, we don't really know too much about it. My grandmother, it is French Canadian, um, descent and Irish. Um, my grandfather actually served in France. His, his name was, uh, Warren Rabidou. He served in France during World War II. Um, but again, you know, not much is handed down to them. He he grew up around the Boston area in, in Somerville, and we weren't really handed anything from from that side. Um, so again, continuing on, you know, I start, you know, I wanted to kind of maybe do something about this. You know, I I help these people on the boat. I go to Montreal, and it, it bothered me to see the treatment from some of my friends. And then you know, I'm a, a huge Boston Bruins fan. Obviously, I'm into sports, um, but um, I'd see how the um, the media would talk about, you know, the French fans, the French, the, the Quebecois fans and things like that. And I didn't really like that either. I'm like, all right, well, how do I reconnect to this? How do I connect to these kind of things? So, you know, I started Googling organizations that had something to do with French um, and French Canadian ancestry. Now, not being a French speaker, I didn't think many would take me or be interested in talking to me. You know, there was that stigma in my head created by the American media and what I'd seen in, in Quebec that maybe because I was an English speaker, they wouldn't want to work with me. Um, fortunately, um, I did find an organization that did was interested in talking to me, and I began to kind of research them, um, you know, see if it would be someone I want to, to work with. Um, wasn't sure if I wanted to reach out because I really, really wasn't sure if I'd fit in because, again, I don't have what most people have, some of these traditions. So I saw the movie Reve. Um, I actually bought it online and had it sent to my house. Um, and watched it a bunch of times on, on a DVD. And, you know, I really, really connected with me. Um, you know, I just couldn't believe some of the things I had seen and some of the, you know, the disconnect. And I wanted, again, I felt that urge to help. So I continued Googling around. I, I heard a couple of interviews with Robert Perot from, from Manchester, who just a wealth of information on our story in, in New England, in particular Manchester. But just to hear, you know, the way he described things and, um, Knowing there was some of that in Manchester, I decided to get involved with uh, the Franco-American Center in Manchester. I talked to the executive director, John Toussignan, uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, he and I seemed to get along really well. Uh, we had very similar ideas for how things should be. Um, and we started, you know, I started volunteering at some of the events and, and going to some of the meetings. And, um, you know, uh, first one of the first uh, projects I took on was a, a YouTube contest. Um, the Concours de la Langue Française. Uh, I love saying that. In um, in uh, on YouTube. Um, so that was the first time there'd been a, a French YouTube contest in New in New England. Um, and you know you got a guy who is just really passionate about you know helping his culture and heritage, running it. No French background at all. But I actually did learn quite a bit listening to some of the videos. 
um, and just kind of maintain that and promoting that. Um, from there, I said, you know, the, the Franco American Center is, is doing some really great stuff. You know, they're helping some people. They're promoting the language. You know, they do some some work in the community. But something's missing. Like, we're not getting enough people. We're not connecting with the young people. Our organization is skewed probably 55 plus predominantly. Not a bad thing. It's just, you know, the, the newer generation like myself, those things weren't handed to them, handed down to them. So I decided to look at the bigger events um, and go back to when I was going to Montreal all the time, Montreal. Um, I uh, had seen Putin, which at the time I called Putin, everywhere, literally everywhere. Like they, that's, you know, that's, you know, I don't know the right terminology, pizza to the, to the Quebecois. I mean, I don't want to, not playing it down, but it's like their traditional food. Um, you know, so I thought, you know, maybe this is something that, that could work here. Um, ironically, I had seen it in Manchester in the early 2000s and when I started my career, I saw the term, I saw poutine, poutine written on something and I was like, what the heck is that? Um, having the knowledge now and how, you know, great of a thing it is, I thought, you know, if poutine is something that the Quebecois created in the 1950s or 60s, it's debatable when it came out, why don't French Canadians in the United States, which is called Franco-Americans, which is, again, is a term that we never used in my family. We didn't know it was a term, but it does make sense to use that term for what we are. Why shouldn't they own that in the United States? Like, you know, pizza is owned by the Italian-Americans and St. Patrick's Day is owned by the Irish-Americans. And the Franco-Americans have a natural, you know, a food that everyone loves that we should be tied to. So I said, you know, we should do something with, with poutine like no doubt I had to do something big like you know some of the, the festivals that the uh, other cultural organizations have um, in New England um, I looked at some of those events um, I actually reviewed some of the things that were going on out in the Midwest uh, Chicago had a poutine fest at the time it was run by folks who um, very well intentioned did a really great job but they don't they don't have the emotional tie to Quebec um, that we, that, you know, some of us do are the folks at the Franco-American Center. Um, so I kind of looked at their event and we tried to replicate it um, here in New England. Um, so my thought was to be to have, you know, what would I want in, in an event? Well, I'd want to go to somewhere and be able to try everything and, you know, hang out, have a good time, bring the family. Um, so, you know, started to do the, the, the mapping for what what I thought would be called, you know, New, Eng New Hampshire Poutine Fest, Poutine Fest, New Hampshire, I don't know what we we're going to call it, would look like. Um, and, you know, we didn't have any restaurants interested because we hadn't talked to anybody. The Franco-American Center does a really great job, but they had never done anything this big. So going to um, restaurants to explain who we were, they wouldn't really even know what the Franco-American Center was. And that's not a knock on them. It's just, it's just not... Um, you know, something, I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth, moving notes around um, and things like that. Um, people just weren't um, aware of them. So I thought, all right, well, you know, Franco American Center is a good spot, but why don't we try something to make us look, you know, I don't know what a Franco American is. Most of my friends don't know what Franco Americans are. They know French Canadians. They know what poutine is, kind of. Let's create a standalone brand so that people don't you know, look at it and say, well, what's this Franco-American thing? You know, get the whole spaghetti and all that nonsense. Um, so we created uh, NH Poutine Fest. Um, it has its own branding, has its own identity. It's separate from um, the Franco-American Center um, in name only. It's run by uh, mostly volunteers from the Franco-American Center. Um, so I created that. Um, my thought would be to have 10 restaurants, do it at a function hall or something like that and go from there. So I create this brand. I start calling around to um, the different um, venues who might take us, and everyone says no. Say, so, you know, I don't think that's going to work for us. You know, maybe, maybe not. Not poutine, something else. So I happened to reach out to the uh, AA team here in Manchester. Well, I'm not in Manchester, but in Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, and the director of events happened to be someone who was French Canadian descent, who actually had family in Montreal still. Um, and she knew what poutine was and was all excited to, to work with us. So we had planned for a small event, um, you know, and I, once I had everything set up with, the, with the, the baseball team at the stadium, in a small part of the stadium, 
we said, you know, let's let's go from there and, and see what happens. So we put the event out on Facebook, and overnight it went viral all over New England. People were talking about it, asking who's going to be there, and we had basically nothing set up yet. Um, this is really a situation where you just kind of dive in, you learn by failing, if in a way. So we had a lot of things go wrong and a lot of things to figure out. But long and the short, our three hundred person event went to thousands. Um, we filled the ballpark. We got ten restaurants that came to us, um, and now it's something that's known throughout New England. Um, so pretty exciting. So um, that's the whole. That's with Poutine Fest, which I still run to this day, and you know, I hope to um, eventually do more with that. We'll see what happens. Um, but in any case, at Poutine Fest, you know, it, it is a very French event. Like we make sure that we have the French language is present. We have Franco-American, French, Canadian, Acadian music. Um, you know, Florida de Lis are all on our, lo- on our branding and our logo. And my really, my goal with that is to um, kind of get to the youth and have them say, well, Poutine Fest is French. I'm French Canadian. Maybe this is, maybe this is a cool thing. So they have like a rallying point to go to. And my hope is they look at this 20 years from now at Poutine Fest or, you know, whatever, 2040. And like, well, Poutine Fest has always been a thing. That's always been the French Canadian thing in New England, just like they talk about other cultural events. So, you know, we'll see what happens. It's been pretty exciting. You know, even to this day, it's got, you know, thousands of followers and, you know, just pretty exciting. So, um looking here on my note list here. Um so I've been doing that for a couple of years um and, and trying to work with other people. Um it's done a great job at the Franco American Center Poutine Fest. Um made some connections in Quebec, um, which has been really fun for me. Um and I know front for them. I do a baseball tournament or slash like friendship game with uh, my friend Luke Trepanier from Saint a Saint in Quebec, and he comes down to New Hampshire and plays a team every year. Um, we created a uh, new Facebook page that, and blog, Luke and I call My French Canadian Family. Um, that blog basically talks about um, news in like the French Canadian Franco world, um, but gives it from our perspective. Some lang- some updates or some um, posts are in French, some are in English. We kind of go back and forth. Um, there's also a Facebook group tied to it, um, called, um, Rev de Gaillon. And, um, the Rev de Gaillon is a group for people in Quebec and in the United States to kind of connect who have that French Canadian, Franco American background, because currently we're separated by language and borders. So, um, you know, there's just no central points for us to come together. Just common folk, you know, we're not in an organization no one's paying for anything. It's just an opportunity for people to get together. Um, that's been a lot of fun. Um, where that goes from here, I don't know. Um, you know, I'll keep going to keep working on Poutine Fest, keep with my, the blog and, um, the Facebook group. But, um, you know, one thing that's really great about this new organization is, um, you know, I could bring some of that knowledge that I've gotten. I mean, I don't think it's a ton of knowledge, but enough to help maybe do some things around the country. I'm not sure. Um, and learn from them. You know, it's great to learn from people who have done things before. So. I can't say how excited I am enough I am to be able to finally get in my New Hampshire silo. Um, you know, family immigrated here so long ago. It would be nice to be able to, to break out a kid. Um, but it will be really great to work with everybody. And, um, you know, really feel fortunate to, to work with this organization. And I look forward to, to getting to know everybody. And thanks for your time.